So let's put motor learning and visual learning together. I want to tell you about some research that Eleanor Gibson conducted with something she called a visual cliff. Now, if you talk to parents, one of the things they're most terrified of is their child um, walking or crawling off of stairs or off a cliff. Eleanor Gibson developed this visual cliff to try to understand how depth perception evolves. Can we see depth, right? More than left, right, but closer and farther away. So she essentially made a cliff, but the cliff was safe because where it looked like the cliff went crashing down, there was actually a big piece of plexiglass. Um, so the child would step off a cliff, but they wouldn't fall because the, the plexiglass um, was holding them up. What Gibson found is that some types of animals um, are born knowing to avoid cliffs. Uh, humans tend not to be one of them. Uh, instead, what we do is we have to rely on what our caregivers tell us is safe for us to do or dangerous for us to do. And there's a really great movie that I want to show you now that indicates that as babies are learning how to crawl and how to walk, they're figuring out what is safe and unsafe for them to do by watching you. So if you'll see here, if a caregiver gets a really scared look on their face, the baby will not go off a cliff. But if the caregiver is smiling and saying, yeah, everything's fine, then the baby will walk right off a cliff. So watch this. Emotion is a nonverbal language. Did you tell me to Emotions reveal the cognition, the understanding of the baby. And furthermore, emotions are the nonverbal communication of the baby towards the parent and the parent towards the baby. So therefore, I thought that emotions were a royal road, one royal road, to the study of the baby's development. In this study, babies between 9 and 12 months are brought into the lab and placed on a large plexiglass top table. Half of the table has a checkerboard pattern just underneath the surface. But halfway across is a visual cliff, which the baby can tell drops off steeply. The plexiglass top continues, so it's perfectly fine to proceed. But the baby isn't so sure. And this is a big drop for a baby just starting to crawl. She wants to get across to get the toy, but she's cautious and looks to the opposite end of the table where her mother is. The parent is instructed to smile or make a fear face. If the mother is posing a fear face, the baby typically does not cross this stair step downward, this modified visual cliff or visual step. On the other hand, if the mother poses a smile or somehow poses a nonverbal communication that is not prohibited but encouraging, the child is much more likely to cross over to her. This particular study demonstrates the role of nonverbal communication in determining the child's behavior in uncertain contexts. A baby will, when they encounter something ambiguous, something uncertain, will typically look to the significant other, the mother, the father, uh, a grandparent, uh, the caregiver, in order to figure out what to do. So by 11 to 12 months of age, the baby is already doing what all of us do when something unusual happens. We look around to figure out how other people are reacting. I want to tell you about a study that a fellow by the name of Andy Meltzoff conducted at the University of Washington. It's just a classic. Somehow he convinced parents to let him conduct a study on brand new babies. This is a picture of Meltzoff when he was young. Basically what he did is he'd get these brand new babies and he'd look right at them and, and get very close to them and uh, um, make a facial gesture. So he might 
um, open his mouth really wide or stick his tongue out or you know make a big blowing sound or a little a little face um, and what he found is that brand new babies imitate not always not every baby but on average they imitate the facial expressions that they see so think about that for a second a baby doesn't even know it has a tongue so how could it think oh someone's sticking their tongue out at me i better stick my tongue out back at them no they can't it's an innate mechanism where we copy what we see and some people have argued that we figure out what we are as a creature by looking around and figuring out, oh, I can copy that movement, so I must be one of them. Now, I said before that we are born into this world helpless, right? We can't feed ourselves, we can't clothe ourselves, we can't build a fire, we can't do anything. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to find a way to get other people to take care of us. And what do other people have? They have faces. So you were born into a world looking for faces. So I've got uh, two pictures here. On the left-hand side is a kind of simplified version of a human face. And on the right side is the same kind of drawing in the sense that all the parts that are in the left face are in the right face. So the right face contains a nose and eyes and eyebrows, but they're rearranged. If you move the picture on the left back and forth in front of a baby, the baby will follow that face. It'll look for that face. If you do the same thing with the scrambled face, babies don't care. So babies come into the world with some understanding of what the human face looks like and they look for that face. That tendency might be something that continues with us all our lives. If you measure where people look when they look at pictures with people in them, they look at the faces. And we continue to see faces where there aren't any. So uh, here's a, you know, clouds, the moon, pretzels look like a face, garbage cans look like a face. Uh, people see, uh, uh, famous faces and religious faces in toast and I think this is an Australian cap with Vegemite on it. We see faces everywhere. We come into this world primed, ready to see faces. Why? Again, because we're dependent on people. Now, I want to, you know, at the beginning here, I talked about how in developmental psychology, we're always improving at some things and getting worse and at others. So I want to tell you about the Thatcher illusion really quickly. Uh, Maggie Thatcher was the Prime Minister of England in the 1980s. And uh, here is um, two pictures of her. One with her face in a normal orientation, upright, and the other with her face upside down. When people first see these pictures, nothing looks particularly strange. But if you look carefully at the upside down drawing of Maggie Thatcher, you might notice that there's something very strange about that picture. So what I'm going to do now is rotate that picture on the right so that it's upright. And if I rotate Maggie Thatcher's picture so that it's upright, then you can see that the eyes and the mouth have been cut out and flipped upside down, right? So what does this mean? It means that we are super sensitive to faces, but only upright faces. Uh, children are actually more sensitive to uh, up, upside down faces than we are, because as we get better with faces, what we're good at gets more and more narrow. We get expertise with upright faces. We specialize in them and we become experts at upright faces, but as we do that, we lose our sensitivity to inverted faces. Come back, we'll talk about language.